Ho, 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 heathens! How y'all doing? I'm the Godless Engineer, and typically I'm critically analyzing apologist claims to give you the best arguments and information so that you can stand up and use your voice. Recently, there was a debate between Jimmy Aiken and John Loftus, as well as Caleb Jackson and Darren Slade, where they discussed the virgin birth. And there was a number of things that were said in that debate that I highly disagree with. I've decided to bring on a special guest uh, for this special edition of Godless Engineer this Christmas season, and that's Dr. Aaron Adair. In this video, we are going to be looking at Jimmy Aiken trying to explain the Star of Bethlehem. If you don't know what that is, the Star of Bethlehem is the star that the Magi follow. I believe it's in Matthew, in order to find Jesus in his cradle. This is not a historical account of anything, and it's no way to be directed toward any particular location. Like, this is the worst GPS tracking that I've ever heard of. But Jimmy Aiken does try to reconcile that with actual reality, and so Dr. Adair, who we've had on recently, is going to be providing his expert opinion about this topic, because if you guys don't know, he actually wrote a book about this. If you want to get Dr. Adair's books, uh, both the Religion and Aliens book, as well as this Star of Bethlehem book, you can look in the description. I've got a link down there where you can go and see a list of all books that are pertinent to this discussion. So if you want to fuck around and find out how wrong Jimmy Aiken is about the Star of Bethlehem, then please... <laughs> Okay, so now okay. we're going to be going on to the discussion of the uh, Bethlehem star. We're going to start off with John Loftus's uh, starting point here, uh, talking about the Bethlehem star. And so I'm kind of interested to hear your take on his argument about the Bethlehem star uh, from you know your experience with the uh, with the the topic in general. And then we're going to get yeah. into Jimmy. When we Hake say experience, making... I mean there is a book that you could get about to talk all about my experience. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, but, uh, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and then we're yeah. going to get into what Jimmy says about the Bethlehem star and different stuff. Mm -hmm. You're fine, honey. Cause then height. Uh, and then we're going to get into what Jimmy says about the Bethlehem star and how he supports it, even though, um, you know, it, it seems like a ridiculous criteria to have, uh, in your, in your, in your, uh, like virgin birth story. Uh, but uh, he he pulls out a number of things that I was like, I am not an astrophysicist or in any kind of field adjacent to that. But even I know that this is somewhat fucky. <laughs> 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 All right. Are you ready to start with Loftus's? OK, now let's turn to the fake star of Bethlehem. Matthew's gospel says the star which the Magi had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stopped over the place where the child was. Now, I've seen all kinds of uh, attempts to find this star, meteor, comet, constellation of planets, supernova, or the type 1C hypernova located in the, uh, the closest galaxy to ours, Andromeda. The fatal problem is that the magical star led the Magi to Bethlehem and stopped in the sky directly over a specific house where Jesus was born. Not only are moving stars nonsense, they don't appear to move in a southern direction from Jerusalem south to Bethlehem. Stars appear to move from the east to the west like the sun because of the spin of the earth. Here's a map. In the middle, you see Jerusalem. You have to go south to, to Bethlehem. The stars had to have traveled south, but that's nonsense. Let's take it. Let's take it. All right. So uh, quickly notes on things. Um, I don't know which translation of that passage that uh, John was using. Um, it's perfectly fine. It doesn't uh, say anything that's... Uh, too inaccurate, but I will note that there is one translation issue that you will find between different versions where it says the star is either in the east or at its rising. That's probably like the only part of the Greek that there's like any notable debate amongst uh, translators. So if you go to like older translations like the King James Version and that, it will say in the east. More modern ones tend to say at its rising or at the rising. The ambiguity exists is because, well, if it says it's rising, well, where do stars and planets and the sun rise? In the east, uh, there's that ambiguity that the term for east and rising is the same term because you use the term uh, anatole for the rising place and the rising place is the east where the sun rises. So um, just noting that little bit of ambiguity. Um, uh, let's see. John also mentioned that, yeah, there has been a 
ton of attempted explanations for what the Star of Bethlehem was. Um, most of them will have at least like two or three or five books relating to some particular thing. He spent a fair bit of time talking about a specific hypernova in Andromeda. That actually only comes from one scientist by the name of Frank Tipler, who wrote a book called The Physics of Christianity. And uh, um, I will note the review of that book by um, Lawrence Krauss uh, was, I believe this is an exact quote, um, I wanted to call this book nonsense, but that would be an insult to nonsense. <laughs> it has things like the reason Jesus could walk on water is that Jesus was able to shoot a beam of neutrinos under himself to project himself forward. And Jesus turned into um, pure neutrinos in his resurrection body, which is why he could um, pass through the tomb and pass through doors like a ghost, because neutrinos are basically ghost particles that could pass through matter like it's not even there. I really wish I were kidding, but this was a book that Tipler published... 20-ish years ago. I forget exactly how long. But uh, as you can imagine, it did not uh, win any Nobel Prizes. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I, w I would say so. I mean, because it, it seems like a bunch of baseless assertions uh, about yeah. things. Uh, so yeah. Stuff that we just simply can't know. Yeah, and what we do know is, one, we can read the text for what it says, and it sure looks like it's describing a miraculous star. And most importantly, and this should be important, I think, to Jimmy, is that um, very often the history of the interpretation of everything is seen as uh, important for how a modern theologian, especially in the Catholic tradition, should. So basically, if this is how St. Augustine, you know, viewed a thing or described a thing, and if, let's say there's, I don't know, complete uniformity in opinions in ancient and medieval commentaries on this sort of thing, I would think that would be somewhat forceful on a Catholic to say, hey, this is what the entire Catholic tradition says. It's basically uh, like the equivalent in legal stuff, uh, stare decisis, the old decisions are uh, decisive factors in how you interpret new things. Well, guess what? The entirety of every single source in antiquity, in Middle Ages, in the um, early modern period, all agree, supernatural star, pointing out a particular location, miraculous motions, uh, the star itself was either um, a miraculous star itself moved around or was in fact an angel, though there's also um, at least one nativity story where the star is actually Jesus. So Jesus comes down as a star to bring that, uh, so that star Jesus can bring them to baby Jesus. It uh, seems like it's requiring Jesus to be in multiple places at once, but in this gospel, totes doable, that's no problem. Uh, it's, uh, I don't want to say Gnostic because that term is uh, way overused, but uh, there are like some of the other uh, Gnostic Gospels or so-called Gnostic Gospels where Jesus can appear as different things to different people at the same time. That's kind of like what's going on in this thing that's called the Revelation of the Magi. And yeah, it has Jesus come down as a star into a cave in the east to guide the um, Magi to the west and then enter another cave where baby Jesus actually is. So Star Jesus meets baby Jesus to form into Voltron Jesus. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> By our I, powers combined, we are the savior. <laughs> <laughs> well, I should specify that the name of the cave is actually um, Castle Grayskull. So Jesus has the power. <laughs> yeah, he does. <laughs> um, uh, alternatively, at the opposite end, I guess, of the Jesus story, there's also, I believe, Ignatius of Antioch reports of... Uh, another sect of, of Christians that believe that Jesus was only revealed after his death and resurrection as a bright star in the sky. Um, mm, yeah, yeah that comes from yeah, his um, epistle to the Ephesians, and then it has this um, what's called the star hymn. <clears throat> um, it looks like that it's actually some sort of insertion that he put in there into his letter. Uh, it doesn't like otherwise match his style, and it seems to be in this hymn form. And, you know, Given the fact that Ignatius was supposed to be dragged off as a prisoner, he's probably not composing brand new poetry that his audience has never heard of before. So it's probably the mm -hmm. case he's citing some older hymn. And yeah, it seems to describe Jesus basically as a celestial body of greater brightness than everything else in the universe, including the sun and moon and like all the planets like dancing around and singing to this star um, and basically having like the rest of the universe go, holy crap, what was that? Yeah which very much goes against the um, Silent Night <laughs> version of Christmas. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. All right, so now right. Uh, Jimmy is going to be getting into his issues with uh, Loftus's argument against the Bethlehem Star, and mm-hmm. um, they're wild. In my, in my opinion, uh, some of the claims he makes are wild. <laughs> Let's take the star, because okay. you said stars don't, that there's nothing that corresponds to what the Star of Bethlehem might have been, and that it led the... Uh, uh, the Magi to Bethlehem and that that's impossible that we don't have moving stars because they orbit in the sky from East to West. Okay. No, I didn't, well, I didn't, say, I didn't say it was impossible. This is a minor point. Look, yeah. Whether possible, impossible, it's at least impossible on physics. Uh, if we're going to say God is omnipotent and can do anything, then uh, the only way we can claim it's impossible is to basically claim that God does not exist or there is something logically impossible about the description of the star. And it's at least imaginable. I wouldn't make the argument that's impossible, but I think uh, John is probably wasting clock on that point. Yeah. Uh, I, and I mean, I, I feel like um, saying that, well, it, you know, I'm not saying it's impossible would would be leaving room for magic to exist. Like essentially what we would understand as magic being that, uh, the ability to defy uh, the natural order of reality or or physics in general. But I feel like that's so minuscule. Uh, it, it, you're right. It would be burning clock in order to make this. this Not not to mention the whole thing we're arguing about is the virgin birth and it's supposed to be a miraculous event. So Mm -hmm. arguing whether, um, God could or could not do it in this sort of thing. It's like, we're, if we're going to say, well, a, the argument that the virgin birth is logically impossible would be one hell of a claim that I would never even uh, try to make. I would definitely stick with historical uh, uh, evidential arguments because, as we mentioned before, when it comes to like premises, well, if you don't believe my premises, you're not going to believe my conclusion. And I definitely don't know how to give you good premises that somehow prove that somehow a virgin birth is logically incoherent, like a four-sided triangle. See, God can do anything if he exists. I'm saying there's no evidence for it. He may have done that. He, did, he There's no evidence for it. I mean, it's, it's nonsensical to well, assume. I, I would... Those- Okay, then I would assume, uh, then I would say that we don't need evidence for this because that's not what happened. The, you, the star, the star. <laughs> so it is an amazing thing when he says, well, we don't need evidence for that. It's like, well, the thing is, I would want evidence whether it is miraculous or not, because that's how we make arguments based on the evidence for our premises. If you're going to say, well, this is naturalistic, so therefore I don't need evidence, is kind of the conceit about why these naturalistic explanations exist in the first place. Because clearly the supernatural star is just so much of a mindfuck for the modern mind. It's like, no, we need some sort of way to at least make this sound plausible. And so whether you make it planets, whether you make it comets, whether you make it alien spaceships, any sort of thing that just makes it go from seemingly impossible to niggling possibility is all that jimmy and most apologists want and that is actually what i found has been the entire history of these sorts of things like the very first star of bethlehem physical theory to explain it was literally in reaction to a deist treatise trying to say that the nativity story was um bunkum and then trying to defend it by saying well maybe it was actually a comet it's like yep we we can see that the whole thing has been apologetic since the 18th century (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> wow, that doesn't surprise me, but uh, that's that's interesting to know. <laughs> was in fact, according to our best evidence, the planet Jupiter. And the planet Jupiter had special significance in Babylonian astrology. Um, based on the omen-based system of astrology used in Babylon, when, Judah, when J- Jupiter did certain things, it signified that a king was going to be born in Amuru, which was the Babylonian name for the West between Babylon and the Mediterranean Sea. Mm-hmm. Okay, now, um, this is not going to be known to the audience here. Um, you're going to be wondering, okay, where is Jimmy getting this? Is Jimmy, uh, you know, an expert scholar in Babylonian omen literature and astronomy and astrology of the past. No. So the source that he's ultimately getting this from <clears throat> is a Swedish guy by the name of Dag Kilman. I believe it's spelled K-I-H-L-M-A-N. And Kilman is also not a uh, professional scholar. Um, in fact, I think he's uh, trained as a computer programmer. And the book that uh, has this sort of argument in it is self-published. So I just want to point out, like, this is where Jimmy is going to. Is he going to 
uh, ancient and medieval commentary? No. Is he going to the top of the line biblical scholarship? No. Is he even going to like the best astronomer um, uh, books out there? Is he def going to me? Definitely not. Uh, what is he going to? He is going to a self-published book by a non-expert to get to these sorts of claims. Now, it's also worth noting what he even says about Kilman's book here is not accurate in that um, in that book by Kilman, he does argue that um, Jupiter is supposed to be the important planet. It's the king planet. It's basically also like um, in the same way, like we call it Jupiter named after the head of the Roman pantheon. The Greeks call it Zeus um, or Zeus a star in Babylonia. They would have called it Marduk or Marduk star. And uh, so clearly it's always like associated with like, you know, the chief deity in that sort of way. Now, there are some things about astrological signs related to a region called Amuru. And originally this term, as he says, is basically the West, to the West of Babylonia. And, well, that also was maybe making you think the Amorites from the Old Testament. Uh, they're not actually connected because what the Old Testament calls Amorites is um, uh, historically problematic. But it's basically talking about Western kingdoms there. And I have to stop and say, but why would it be in a modern context a Babylonian reading this as still referring to Syria, uh, the Levant, and places like that? Couldn't you be thinking, like, is there some other really big, powerful kingdom to the West? Something, like, really, like, Western civilization might be thinking of. Some really big city. It's like I'm on the tip of my tongue. Row, 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 row your boat gently down the Tiber to Rome. Why couldn't he be talking about the Roman uh, equivalent to the king, Caesar Augustus. Instead, what Jimmy's going to be going here is talking, of course, about somehow it ultimately has to relate to Judea. Why? Because that's what the theory needs. Not because there's actually evidence for it, but because, hey, this region kind of sort of overlaps with Judea. Therefore, it's now going to become specific to that region, which is, if not logically fallacious, it's definitely historically dubious. Um, and also, there's also a bit of a two-step here that both uh, Kilman doesn't realize, Jimmy doesn't realize, uh, and most other scholars who might go with this don't uh, realize that they're doing. They are citing the Babylonian omen literature, which is completely irrelevant to our subject matter. These are supposed to be, as the Greek says, magoi uh, aposanatales. This is uh, magi from the east. And magi, these eastern magi, are Zoroastrian priests. Confusing Zoroastrians or Persian priests with Babylonian priests is like confusing modern-day Iranians and Iraqis. Sure, Iran, Iraq, it's only one little difference, right? It's like the cultural difference is so wide, and you wouldn't just, you know, mix up the two, and if you do mix up the two, believe me, there's going to be quite a few Iranians to tell you the difference. Do not confuse them with an Iraqi by a long shot. Um... This is the issue here. So by relying on Babylonian omen literature to talk about what Zoroastrians would have believed is um, a category error. It's also worth noting, we actually don't know to what extent this omen literature is indicative to how um, interpretation would have been done at this time. We actually have a few things to note here. One is that the omen literature by this point was really being superseded by... Um, horoscopic astrology. So just so everyone knows, because I know not everyone is memorizing astrology, and that's probably for the best, because <laughs> it's, you know, at least in modern days, completely nonsense. But there's basically different forms of astrology. The one that basically is like looking at your birth charts and things like that, that's um, basically horoscopic astrology and, you know, trying to give like, you know, predictions about your future based on when you were born or potentially when you were conceived. And that had become the more popular form of astrology. <coughs> At this point, especially with um, the fact that Babylonia no longer had a Babylonian king, that's a thing worth noting, that there was, like, no Babylon in terms of, like, a political entity, basically by the time of Cyrus the Great in, like, the 6th century BCE, because uh, Cyrus basically came in and said, nice kingdom you got there, it's mine now. <laughs> and uh, Babylonia was not an independent political entity pretty much uh, ever again. There was never a Babylon, Babylonia uh, after that point. So um, at this point, like the scholars in there kind of had switched away from omen literature relating to the kingdom to this more horoscopic stuff. And we actually have horoscopes in clay tablets over centuries. And those themselves only go into about 60 or so BCE. 
at which point there's then a gap between that and the oldest Western horoscope, and the methods between the two also aren't quite the same. So it's then a question of, well, which version of horoscopic astrology was going to be used in the East at that time? We don't have overlap between the two. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so we really don't know, actually, even which form of astrology they may have been using. But the omen stuff that he's relying on would have basically probably been phased out or at least not interpreted the same way. And reading the stuff from the 5th or 6th or 7th century um, uh, astrology diaries is kind of missing the point. Yeah, you know, when Jimmy was kind of going over this section here, it really... Uh, like, uh, I guess, uh, brought up in my mind, like numerology, uh, mm. you know, the different number games that they play with like scriptures and all this other stuff, because it just seems like they're taking the data and then they're morphing it to fit whatever they want instead of like actually following evidence. Yeah. And it's worth noting, like you mentioned numerology, well, like, um, Gamatria, that was a form of numerology that was popular at this time as well. And we know Gamatria was used by Jews and Christians. In fact, the best example of that is the number 666 or 616 in the book of Revelation. But of course, when it comes to interpreting that, how you interpret that is evidence. You don't twist it to get to the conclusion you wanted to. You look at the manuscript tradition um, and the, uh, you know, the actual uh, evidence on the ground that's contemporaneous to get to that conclusion rather than grab a little bit from this region, from this time period, mash it all together, um, swirl it up and uh, turn it into a smoothie of apologetics. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm reminded that the uh, J uh, Jewish Christians or different Jewish uh, sects rather, they were you know, you know, fumbling with the numbers in Daniel in order to predict when the Messiah would come. And there were several mm -hmm. groups that were doing this at the time, including these scenes. And so um, it's just, uh, it's kind of interesting how, uh, you know, Jimmy's argument sort of matches up with the logic as presented by the, uh, the number finagling of. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, and, and yeah, of Gamatria? course, when it comes to, yeah, Gamatria is, yeah, where you're, um, you're, yeah, you're taking, the numeric value of letters and adding them or doing oh. other uh, arithmetic operations with them to try to get meaning. So like certain numbers have special meaning. So like um, seven is this, you know, good number. Eight is perfection, things like that, which uh, are true in that system, but obviously has no actual uh, uh, physical truth to it. Uh, and of course, Often these things are extremely flexible. You mentioned the Daniel prophecies. Well, I mean, those sorts of interpretations don't even, you know, die off with the Essenes. Uh, it looks like uh, during the time of Bar Kokhba, there were people who were trying to uh, align the calendar with his revolt. Uh, or even in more modern times with uh, Sabbatai Svi in the um, 1600s, also people trying to argue like, oh, the uh, end times are coming based on um, other numerological or even astrological argumentation. So um, this sort of thing has been uh, amazingly flexible. And if you doubt it, well, remember the same sorts of arguments were done by Harold Camping several years ago to predict the end of the world in 2011. And pretty much any day that ends in Y is also predicted to be the end of the world based on somebody's calculations. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting how they can finagle like all of this stuff in order to meet whatever whatever conclusion they want to come to. And um, the only kingdom in that area was uh, what the only substantial kingdom in that area was Israel. And so consequently, when Babylonian Magi saw Jupiter do something in the sky in 3 BC that indicated that a king was going to come from Amuru and knock over the Babylonian dynasty, they concluded we need to establish uh, some kind of mission to this new king who can help liberate us from the Persians. Okay. So first off, there is nothing in that omen literature that says a king will be born. And the Magi are coming and saying, where is he who is born king of the Jews? Mm -hmm. None of these prophecies uh, or none of these omens ever talk about the birth of a king. And again, we have to say Amuru now has this very limited sense because that's the only place with a substantial kingdom. Again, I'm going to point out there was another very, very substantial kingdom to the um, west of Babylonia. Again, the Roman Empire. And if you wanted help fighting the Persians, well, guess what? The Roman army had already had a few goes at the Persians. Uh, that would be... Well, among the goes at the Persians, you had... Um, 
uh, Crassus, the uh, at the time the richest person in all of Rome, and was trying to get himself some glory to compete with that uh, Pompey the Great and Julius Caesar, but ended up getting his legions completely decimated and the um, uh, eagles lost. Uh, Mark Antony had led missions uh, fighting the Persians. Uh, at one point, there was a buildup of troops in 20 BCE with uh, um, uh, Caesar Augustus basically looking like he was like building up, threatening like another invasion of Parthia, but ended up getting a really good peace deal out of all of it. Bas and of course, if you go then decades later, there's all sorts of wars between the Romans and the Persians. So if I were a person trying to get and to push out Persian control of a place, I wouldn't go to Herod with his piddling size army. By the way, where does Herod actually get his power? From Rome. Um. If I was going to go anywhere to look for any sort of grand king, I would probably look for the one who is saying he's already the son of a god because of a star seen in the sky. That's the case with uh, Julius Caesar becoming a star allegedly at his death. And then uh, uh, Caesar Augustus, his adoptive son, then basically claiming, look, I'm the son of a god now, at least adopted. Uh, you know, little details like that, uh, allowing for enough, you know, stuff to put on his coinage. I'm now the son of the divine Julius. Um, give me all the power. And of course, he had won the Civil War at this point. So everyone was like, yep, you got it. <laughs> yeah. The, yeah. I the mean, Roman I think that makes way more useful. logical sense. Yeah. And um, also all this talk about wanting to overthrow the Parthians. OK, let's look at also one other little logistic thing. I mentioned the Babylonians. Babylonia had fallen as a political entity with the forces of Cyrus the Great in the 500s BCE. So quite literally, Babylonia is gone because of the Persians in the 500s. And this is like part of the establishment of the great uh, Achaemenid Empire. And the Achaemenid Empire would basically go all the way from modern day Afghanistan all the way to Egypt at its highest extent. You know, big mother duck and empire for a long time. And the only thing that ended up being even bigger was when then Alexander the Great came through and decided, I'll have that and some more. Um, and then Babylonia is then under Greek control when Alexander dies in Babylon. And by the way, we actually have basically the horoscope for when Alexander died. So in a sense, we actually have the birth certificate, the, the death certificate for Alexander. Um, beat that, Jesus. <laughs> um, so we have... Babylon under Greek control when uh, Alexander dies, it then goes under the control of one of his generals and is basically under Greek control for a while under the Seleucid Empire until that's finally undone by the Parthians, which is another resurgence of the Persians. And so basically Babylonia is going back and forth between Persian, Greek, and then Persian control again. So we're talking now 500 years after all that, there's this group that's still angling for independence. Really? What's the evidence for that? Uh, just some rebels that have just, you know, twiddling their thumbs for 500 years. And they're going to do it by going to a client kingdom controlled by another power instead of direct to the ones that actually could do anything useful. This just makes no actual historical sense. And again, this also misses one other very important point that I need to highlight again. The people in Babylonia were not Magi. Those would, the term that would have been used are the um, Chaldeans. And you don't confuse the two in the same way you don't confuse a Jewish rabbi and a Catholic priest. You might be saying, oh, but isn't it all? They're both religious people. It's like, yeah. And if you get them in a bar, they might get into a fight. They're not the same religious groups. <laughs> this is the same sort of mixing of things. And it's kind of a sidestep because the people coming over are not um, Babylonians or Chaldeans. They are Persians or at least part of the Persian priesthood. And guess what? You know who doesn't want to overthrow the... Um, uh, power structures in Persia, the Persians. Persians. Guess what? The Magi are actually literally part of the um, Persian apparatus. So basically you have the Magi as the priesthood, you have the various nobles, and them in combination basically um, act as almost like a senate to the king, and if the king dies, um, the successor is chosen by them. So the Magi are like right in there, part of the entire power system of the Persian Empire. So there's no sense of why they would go to another country to somehow get an army to fight themselves. 
Yeah, I was about to bring yeah. up like, weren't these magi like in, from uh, you know the Zor- Zoroastrianism uh, or yeah, Zer- um, uh, yeah, yeah, and you will find a couple of exceptions in the ancient commentaries about where they came from, if they were Persian or Arab um, or Babylonian. But the term itself, Magoi, it is basically, especially by saying Magoi from the east, that's designating that priesthood of the Magi who basically became the Zoroastrian priesthood sometime perhaps in the 3rd, 4th century BC. There's a little bit of murkiness exactly when they became the priests for that religion. Mm-hmm. Um, but nonetheless, by that point, they are definitely like the ones that are running the fire temples that are, you know, the ones that are all about Zoroastrianism and its chief god, um, Ahura Mazda. Um, though other gods are important as well. <clears throat> and also, one other thing worth noting, uh, we also know from Zoroastrian literature that they would have looked at Jupiter and not said, oh, not the birth of a king. They would have said, oh, crap, Jupiter's moving again. All of the planets were considered to have been corrupted by the evil god of Zoroastrian, um, Arhimod, basically the equivalent of Satan. Anything mm-hmm. that was moving against the background stars um, was actually considered to have been corrupted. So seeing like the various like loop de loop motions of a planet like Jupiter would not have indicated, oh, good tidings. It's like they would have said, oh, crap, Satan's at it again. <laughs> <laughs> they, they only showed any sort of like interest in um, Zodiac style astrology and things like that much, much later, like no earlier than like the third, fourth, fifth century AD. So like way after this time. And they definitely wouldn't have also been picking up old cuneiform tablets to do this. They would have been um, based. Well, we actually know which sources of um, astrology they use because we actually have the translations of that into the Persian language. And they were taking it from Greco-Roman sources as well as some Indian sources. In other words, they weren't copying the Babylonian tablets. It's a whole red herring. It's the wrong people. It's the wrong form of astrology. It's the wrong time. Just it's a, it's, it's a cavalcade of wrong. Right. Yeah. And even if uh, Jimmy were to, you know, say, well, there's Zoroastrian priests, it kind of seems like he's being a bit anachronistic here in in what he's asserting. Would that be accurate? Yeah. Yeah. The the fact that he's talking about Babylonians when the Bible is talking about uh, at least most likely Persians or at least Persian priesthood members, then, yeah, he's uh, it's kind of a two step that he may not even be aware of what he's doing um, at this point, because it's often the case that people make these sorts of mistakes or assume the Magi were just doing the same things as the uh, Babylonian priests, that they were also astrologers. This is actually a mistake from antiquity. So here's an interesting little problem. Um, The faith of Zoroastrianism is supposed to go back to a prophet. Prophet's name in the original uh, Avestan language would have been been pronounced something like um, Zarathustra. And the meaning of that name is still debatable. But when it gets turned into its Greek version, it becomes Zoroaster. And that latter half of the name, Aster, looks and is spelled like the Greek word for star, Aster. And Mm -hmm. so there is all this belief that, oh, Zoroaster was basically a founder of astrology. And so there's all these like fake manuals of magic and astrology um, penned by Zoroaster. And a lot of that is based on the idea that, hey, these Magi people, they do esoteric stuff and their chief prophet has the word star in his name. So he must do star stuff. This was a Western stereotype that had developed, but it's also disconnected from what the Magi themselves were doing. They did things like dream interpretation. They did um, magical stuff like that, but they didn't show any interest in astrology until much later. And when um, during the what is called the Sassanid Empire, the Sassanids basically came after the Parthians, but it was still another Persian empire. It's the last like great Persian empire um, before the Arab conquest. And the Sassanids also decided to go hog wild on like getting as much scientific literature as possible and translating it into Persian. And then we see the reaction of the religious groups to that incoming um, Western astronomical and astrological knowledge. There's actually these like um, dialogues that were written between um, Zoroaster or Zarathustra and these um, uh, astrologers and basically Zoroaster, you know, poo-pooing them for doing that. And this is in literature like from the fifth century AD. So you can see like in the same sort of way that like a lot of like um, conservative religious uh, Christians will say negative things about astrology because they think it's against the Bible. The Zoroastrians were basically kind of doing that same sort of thing. Hey, this stuff goes against our religion, and only after a long time did they start finally integrating it into their belief systems and actually do any sort of astrology before the Muslims uh, came in, and then they inherited that um, 
collection of traditions. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, are you ready to continue with Jimmy's uh, sp- uh, spill here? I think so. I think okay. so. I've, uh, the coffee's obviously working well for me, so let's keep going. <laughs> <laughs> so we have evidence from Babylonian astrology, specifically from their astrological texts, that indicate that some of the things that Jupiter did in 3 BC and 2 BC would signal the need to have a friendship mission to the newborn Jewish king. They therefore went to Jerusalem. (laughs) All right. So there's a couple of things here that um, I let pass by before, but I shouldn't. He said three and two BCE. Now that should put us and make us all pause because wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. According to the gospel of Matthew, it says that they came to King Herod, Herod the Great. And we are able to deduce with really high confidence that by 4 BCE, Herod was dead as a doornail and rotting. So this stuff about stuff happening in 2 BCE to bring the Magi to King Herod, who would have been buried by this point, is historically problematic. So um, I forget how Kilman argues this, if he argues about this in his book, um, or Jimmy Aiken's going this from other material, but there are all of these attempts to try to change when Herod the Great reigned, because um, one of the other issues here is, hey, there's account does not clash, does not uh, mesh well with the Gospel of Luke that talks about the census under Quirinius, which we know can date only to 67 BC, or sorry, 67 CE, so basically about a decade after the death of Herod. Uh mm-hmm. So there's this attempt to move Herod's date and also try to move the census back or have some other kind of census. And this is um, a part of another collection of apologetics that's just all hidden under just by saying 2 BCE. So when I talk about uh, him smuggling in premises, I mean, it was bad enough he was bringing in a huge amount of metaphysics into his first premise of his argument. But now he's basically bringing in historical revisionism (laughs) to even have this astrological theory even begin to be talked about. So... Minor little detail, minor little detail, minor little detail. Um, also, this idea of a friendship mission. Oh, goodness, goodness. Um, what do you know about King Herod? Um, I mean, he was a pretty bad dude. Uh, I remember, um, you know, he, I think, didn't he, like, um, like, kill some nephews of his or something at one time? Like, a lot of people had a problem with uh, a couple of executions. More like his sons. Did. I don't know. And his wife's oh, sons. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, allegedly, um, Caesar Augustus said uh, better to be Herod's pig than his son. Uh, and the pun works because the word for pig and son is very similar sounding in Greek. Uh, <laughs> ah, OK. Um, but yeah. Uh, but yeah, Herod killed more sons than he did pigs. <laughs> <laughs> um, so he was known as, you know, being pretty darn tyrannical, uh, you know, Probably not the best family man, especially if you're one of his sons, um, or if there's any suspicion. But it's also worth noting, how did he come to power? And I already noted that basically the reason he has power is because of Roman backing. But it's also worth noting that originally um, his family had power because his father um, basically did a solid for Julius Caesar. When Julius Caesar was um, trapped in urban fighting in Alexandria, um, when uh, he went down there to chase Pompey and then got locked in and decided, like, okay, I'm trapped here. I'm going to drink a lot and uh, have sex with Cleopatra, among other things. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, uh, he's trapped in there because the um, uh, rival faction in Alexandria has basically got his troops trapped in there. And um, uh, Caesar sends out, uh, you know, statements to other uh, friends of the East saying, hey, could you, like, you know, send some soldiers my way and help me? Uh, and one of them was um, Herod's father. And because of that, uh, that already uh, basically then put him in good graces with uh, Julius Caesar. And so that means, of course, when coming back to the Holy Land, it's like now he's got like, you know, Roman authority behind him. So when uh, Herod, you know, grows up and takes place and having power along with his older brother, uh, they're basically uh, under Roman backing until uh, Julius Caesar does something stupid. He gets himself killed. And the Persians actually try coming in and actually taking control of a lot of the East. So they take control of Syria. uh, They take control of the Levant. They take control of Jerusalem. And in particular, they captured the high priest and they captured Herod's older brother. The high priest, um, they 
And when I say captured, it was actually also, at least according to Josephus, under dubious circumstances. We're supposed to be going in for peace talks, but instead they basically get captured. The high priest has his ear defigured so he can no longer be the priest. And um, the older brother um, is trapped. And at least according to Herod, uh, sorry, at least according to Josephus, he um, bashes his own brains out to commit suicide rather than to be taken back and tortured uh, by the Persians. So that is what Herod the Great escapes, comes back basically with Roman backing to push out the Persians and finally then sit on the throne. Towards the end of his life, there was also apparently this plain plot against him. And when he was interrogating people, and by interrogating, we mean torturing, they also said that the Persian king um, was trying to poison him. So Herod already has like a lifelong hatred of the Persians and the Persian empire, and even thinks that there are active attempts to assassinate him by the Persian government. So when members of the Persian government come saying, where's the king? How does that sound the least bit like a friend mission to talk to Herod, the most paranoid proper person probably there, who particularly has it out for Persian authorities? Holy crap. Well, that's not how you make a peace mission. <laughs> well, I mean, that's why they got to be Babylonians. Exactly. <laughs> it's, it, it's a requirement of the hypothesis to ignore the words on the page to get it to twist to what we needed to say. And we, by the way, we, <laughs> we haven't even talked about the motions of the star yet. We're just talking about the political setup making no sense. So these would be the things. Um, there's, I guess, also a bit of a mistake, I would say, that John had done here where, yes, he points out the motions of the star are miraculous. And we'll get into that a little bit later. But if you already believe in miracles, that doesn't really knock down the um, Catholic here who already believes in a miraculous virgin birth. My... Um, argument that I make in my book on the Star of Bethlehem is all these additional historical problems that even if you believe in miracles, uh, here are all these other historical problems, such as the political situation of Persians coming into um, Herod's kingdom. Herod hates the Persians. And also this is Roman territory. So Persians coming in, declaring a different king is running a Roman territory. You're now asking for the Romans to come in and kick butt and take names. And this, of course, did not happen. We have a pretty good historical record. And a war like that between the two superpowers would have been like um, reading about the Cold War and uh, someone telling you, oh, yeah, there's that huge fight between the Soviets and uh, the uh, Americans over Greenland. And it's like, well, I didn't find that in the history book because it didn't happen. It's the same sort of thing here. There is no giant fight over um, the Holy Land between these two superpowers because this event didn't take place, even if miraculous stars are possible. Yeah. Oopsies. <laughs> that there was a lot to take in. Uh, are you ready to continue? I, I'm also have to press, you know, we've only been, you know, uh, what, two minutes of Jimmy talking and I've put out what an hour of issues with just what he said there. So you might also think, Hey, these things are a little bit complicated. Maybe I shouldn't just jump to the self-published book by the non-expert uh, that goes against the entirety of the consensus of biblical studies for the last 200 years. You might want to bring a better game to this fight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you would you would think so. <laughs> Which is the place Jewish kings lived and said, so where is he? Where's the newborn king? They had to be told to go to Bethlehem. They were not following the star. They then set out to Bethlehem, which is six miles south of Jerusalem, and it's slightly to the west of Jerusalem. So the road turns to the west. As they're going, they see Jupiter in front of them in the sky. And they rejoice because that was a providential coincidence. They didn't know they were going to see Jupiter, but they see Jupiter in the sky. All right. So first off, providential coincidence. If we are supposed to believe that these guys are astronomers, astrologers, there's no coincidence in seeing Jupiter in the sky. It's fucking Jupiter, okay? You I, I don't mean, miss I, it. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, I thought that that was the whole reason why they went that like that direction was it not isn't that what jimmy said he's he's like so, oh, so he is correct that the text does not say that they followed the star to jerusalem you find that no. in later um um accretions to the story and other uh gospels infancy gospels if you read the gospel of matthew it doesn't say anything about the star leading them to jerusalem all the leading stuff happens once they've gone to Jerusalem and then they're on their way to Bethlehem. And so when Jimmy here says, oh, the star was in front of them, that's not what the text says. That Even in English, it says the star went before them. This is a conjugation of the verb to go, which means to move. It's not just 
standing there in place. It is moving in that direction. And this is also mm-hmm. true in the Greek. You, uh, I don't know if you want to pop up the, you know, like uh, Greek text of this as well, because we'll probably have some details to get through there. But the key thing is the term being used there is a term that tells us the star is moving and it's moving in that direction. It went before them. It was traveling in the direction the Magi are going to take to Bethlehem, basically in a southerly direction, which is a direction that stars and planets do not move. So he's going to also then talk about, well, the road kind of turns to the west, and so it's going to match with the rotation of the Earth. It's like, first off, for this sort of matching to work, you basically have to have the Magi running at some extremely exact speeds and tilting their heads in just the exact sort of way to make this sort of illusion work where the star is somehow going to always stay in the same place in the sky uh, while it's also going through diurnal motion, uh, so it's always over Bethlehem. So um, as far as I know, the uh, trip from... Jerusalem to Bethlehem is not on rails like a theme park ride, so it is not going to follow any sort of exact speeds and motions that um, are wanted here. And it's also not what the text says anyways, because it says not the star is in front of them, it's going before them. In fact, the term used implies the star is actually leading them in the direction to follow. Uh, it's the same term that's used throughout the Gospel of Matthew for talking about um, such and such person this way, and then Jesus or the Jesus' disciples went that way as well. They followed along in that same direction. In other words, motion. Yeah. So completely sidestepping that, but you don't even have to go to the Greek. Just even in English, it says went. It's the verb to go. It is the verb for him saying, I'm moving. <laughs> right. So it's not that they followed the star there. It's that the star went there before them. And then, uh, which, which, I think, well, I mean, which kind of leads them along the way. Um, if, cause it's, right. if it's traveling the way that they're going, it's leading them forward. In fact, uh, it's even more specific than that because in the Greek there, it uses the, um, verb, uh, proago and it then, um, takes a definite article, which basically means this thing is acting on this thing. Uh, it's a transitive, or sorry, uh, yeah, it's a transitive verb here. Um, I'm trying to remember all my linguistics right now. I might need more coffee to get that all straight. Uh, but, but it's basically saying this is what the star is doing to them. It is leading them. It is um, bringing them in the direction to go. Uh, this uh, underlying verb, um, ago, is also like combined with other wing, uh, words to like mean like to lead by the hand, to like you know bring someone forward and things like that. So it is the sort of word that you would use to talk about a star guiding you along the way, it is not how any astronomer ever describes a star in the entire history of anything. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, and, you know, honestly, uh, Jimmy's about to get into, like, how the star settles over a specific location and everything. Mm-hmm. But it that, that's still, like, what he's about to get into seems like Sincere. it's just somebody making circumstances fit what they want instead of, like you know, anything else. Like, it just seems like, oh, look, this star's above this house. Therefore, I'm supposed to go to this house. But you could literally stand in front of any other structure and it'd be like, oh, this star's over this structure. I'm supposed to go here. And This star's over this turtle. The turtle must be the Messiah. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Fucking Messiah turtle. (laughs) You know, I I could get behind that. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Because the sky rotates to the west at 15 degrees per hour, and it's about a two-hour trip to Bethlehem from Jerusalem on foot, Jupiter would have moved 30 degrees from east to west in the sky in front of them as the road is turning to the west. So Jupiter would appear in front of them and stay in front of them as they went. Because the road is turning to the west, Jupiter is moving to the west. When they get there, They look up above the house, they see Jupiter and interpret it as a providential sign. There's nothing impossible about this. All right. So he's implying that the star will have stopped because the Magi get to their destination and then stop in place. Uh, Do you want to bring up the Greek? Uh, Because I I, I need to point out a word because it just gets skipped over by Jimmy here. And it often gets skipped over in modern translations. So uh, we are starting off with, uh, you know, the announcements and then the uh, Magi leaving and then and lo and behold, uh, the star which they had seen either in the east or at the rising, so that N tan atele, that's probably the only thing you're going to find any significant divergence between translations. But then you get uh, the verb proegin, that's a conjugation of proago, and proago means to lead or to uh, bring forward, to proceed. So it's basically saying it's going forward ahead of them, uh, and then the them, otos, until 
And then here's a word that Jimmy completely skips over, elfon. This is the participial form of the verb erkomai, which means to come or to arrive. And this is in the singular form, so it's talking about the star arriving, not the magi, not the wise men. The star arrives at a location. And what does it do when it arrives? It stands. Uh, So uh, there's one other little detail here. So this says uh, istathe, and I think that is how it's found in... um, You'll see a small difference that you also see uh, este in, I think, the Texas Receptus, what the um, King James Version is based on. Uh, It's just basically active passive form of the same word. It doesn't really affect the meaning here. But basically, the star stood. It stopped. Uh, It arrived, and then it stopped. Where did it stop? Over where the child was. And that word over there is also a specific word. Now, Jimmy's going to basically say, well, the star was over like it's overhead, like up in the sky at Zenith. Well, not only is the star going to be over any other house in all of Bethlehem by that logic, but that's not even what the word here would mean in that sort of context. The term you would use if you were trying to talk like like high up in the sky is a different um, preposition, uh, hooper. It's also from like where we get our word super. Uh, It has the same like Indo-European roots ultimately. So um, like Josephus talks about a comet high in the sky over Jerusalem during the um, uh, Jewish war and he uses hooper. Other astronomers will use that sort of term to talk about things up in the sky. Epano, and specifically epano, followed then by a word in the genitive, is basically a way of saying something is like on top of or hovering right above. So, for example, when Jesus talks about a city on a hill, he uses the exact same construction. When he talks about the angel that comes to um, the empty tomb and then sits on the door, same construction. Uh, if you want something not right on top of but hovering over a little bit, if you go to um, the crucifixion scene, it talks about the sign above Jesus. It uses apano in the same sort of structure. So that is the sort of valence that this word means. It doesn't mean way high up in the sky unless you think this cross that Jesus was on was also like Godzilla sized, like it is in the Gospel of Peter. Um, but that ain't it here. At least I don't think Matthew was saying it's a giant talking cross like it is in that Gospel. Um, if you haven't read that gospel, it's a hoot, by the way. We only have a fragment of it, but it's another fragment to say, man, Christians were weird, weren't they? <laughs> <laughs> but the key thing is, this is not saying something high up in the sky. This is something specifically over the locale where the child was. You have to go to the next verse for it to specify that that place the child is is in a house, which is helping tell us, hey, where is this star? It's hovering right over a house. Uh, it's Okay, v- verse 11, next verse. I can't remember if it's verse 10 or 11. Um, yeah. And having come into the house, um, so they're coming into the house to give their gifts, and it's inside the house that you find Mary and baby. So this is telling us where uh, it's hovering right over where the child was. Where was the child inside a house? So where's the star? It's hovering right above a house. In fact, in at least one movie version I have found, it is right at the um, uh, door frame of uh, the Holy Family. So at least in one older movie version, they really try to make that... Um, hyper literal, like the star is like standing right over there, just like it's in your nativity set, because, well, you definitely don't have a nativity set that puts the star in the stratosphere. <laughs> yeah. So it seems yeah. like, uh, what, I, what, uh, Jimmy is doing is, right. is now, departing but, from the original I, intent of the gospels, what he would call God's word. And mm-hmm. he's making it be Jupiter, which is, you know, would be a star in the sky or what you would perceive as a star in the Ooh. sky. Uh, we'll have to get to that huh? later because so it's, they're actually going to make some hay about the language there, but I'll save that for later when they talk okay. about Jupiter versus the word for star. But yeah. Right. And then uh, and so it, it's actually in the original text, literally like a star or a light hey. that is hovering like very locally close to yes. the house, like it's, right on top of it. And there's actually one other thing perhaps worth highlighting if we go to verse two of chapter two. Um, there's one other bit of specificity about this star that's probably worth noting. Uh, scroll down a little bit, a uh, little bit more. They've seen, ah, here's the thing. His star, uh, ton astron atu, or so atu ton uh, astra. This is saying it's not just any star, it's his star. It is the star of the king of the Jews. Or, mm-hmm. Now, you have to imagine, okay, according to Jimmy, the star is supposed to be Jupiter. What ancient culture looked 
at the stars and said, that is a star of the Jewish king. Show me the documentation for that, because I can guarantee you it ain't there. <laughs> yeah, all I, the more I, so. I, I and if you're even... thinking in Judaism as well, no, because actually the Jewish term uh, used for Jupiter, they called it uh, Zedek, basically the Hebrew word for righteous, like righteous uh, king or righteous God. Um, <clears throat> so they didn't want to actually name any of the stars after gods, as you can imagine, a culture that's supposed to be only praising um, Adonai should not be naming their um, celestial bodies after those demonic uh, beings that the pagans worship. Um, so Jupiter is just called righteous, the, the righteous thing. And they definitely don't name it, you know, uh, star of the king of the Jews. There's just nothing for there in Judaism. And you definitely don't expect Babylonians to say that's the king of the Jews star because, you know, again, they named it after Marduk, uh, if anything. Yeah. So that little phrase there, again, let's go back to his earlier premise that anything the New Testament asserts is true. This asserts that this star was his star. This was Jesus's star, not a common planet in the sky named after other pagan gods. <sighs> Good times. <laughs> Good times. <laughs> I got to say, this is a lot. Like, there's a lot wrong with what Jimmy is saying here. And it's like every few seconds. <laughs> Uh, yeah, There's nothing scientifically improbable about this. This is all the normal natural movements of Jupiter as understood when you have the correct background from Babylonian astrology and when you read the text of Matthew in a careful way. So I would dispute what you said about the star. All right. right. Pigeon now, shitting um, on the chessboard. <laughs> yeah. And I have to say, um, if you read it correctly, it's like, you know, are there other scholars or experts out there who can read the underlying texts and uh, know the sorts of material and have their own opinions about this. Well, there happens to be a book that can help with that. Um, now, I'm not hawking my book. I'm going to be hawking a different one. Uh, just give me a second to go grab it. I forgot to grab it beforehand. Mm -hmm. This is a volume from Brill, and in the hardcover form, that means you can either buy this book or you can pay rent. You can't do both. <clears throat> but this book was um, based on the conference proceedings back at the University of Groningen and back in 2014. The book is called The Star of Bethlehem and the Magi, and it collects a bunch of experts in things like um, Iranian religion, Babylonian astrology, um, Greek astrology, uh, New Testament studies. Um, and you're going to find that uh, the people who know this material are basically like, yeah, this ain't the case. In fact, it was supposed to be particularly resolving around like one astronomer's hypothesis that got a fair bit of scholarly attention. And uh, one of the experts on Iranian religion basically referred to it as Da Vinci Code level nonsense. Um, and that actually makes it into the book. It wasn't even just said in the conference. It's like literally in print. This is Da Vinci Code level uh, stuff. Now, uh, you might be flipping through this book and you're going to see some uh, names that... Uh, you know, some of them are fairly important in like the history, uh, the study of astronomy, like Owen Gingrich, who did, he died just this year, I think like nearly 100 years old, but absolute uh, uh, brilliant person who did a lot of work in like the um, acceptance of the Copernican theory um, back in the day, uh, tracked down basically like every first and second edition copy of the book and looking at the marginal notes to figure out what's going on there. Um, and there's uh, other experts here in their uh, various places. Roger Beck, who's like one of the experts in Mithraism. And this guy by the name of, I can't read that, uh, this name. Uh, it me. <laughs> oh, oh, it's you, Aaron and Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so when I talk about this conference and these conference proceedings, um, I know it pretty well because I was there and uh, uh, basically found that, yeah, most of the people who know what they're talking about, uh, they're on my side, not Jimmy's. Right. Just saying. <laughs> not to not to do a big flex over here, but <laughs> um, I, I, actually, I'm going to do one flex. Um, so I was talking about the Greek before, and one of the contributors to this volume is um, Annette Mertz. Uh, she, along with Gerrit Thiessen, wrote um, literally like the book on the historical Jesus. It's called The Historical Jesus. And um, she's there for her, you know, uh, you know, knowledge of uh, New, Jesus, uh, New Testament studies and Jesus studies, historical Jesus studies, or what we can't say about the historical Jesus studies. And she points out, like, and here are the major reasons why most New Testament scholars don't think the birth narratives are historically reliable. And when she does talk about the star and about its meaning, 
she cites me for how to interpret the Greek. So um, I got at least one New Testament scholar um, who in print is willing to say, yeah, I didn't completely um, F this up. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's pretty awesome right there. <laughs> yeah, so I will toot my horn when my horn is loud. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. You should definitely toot the shit out of that. <laughs> hey, Jimmy, you real quick, are... I'm trying to read my Bible. Where, uh, What verse in the Bible is it in Matthew that says Jupiter? Uh, it which doesn't. one is that? It says, it says oh. a, a star. Is, it, is that what and, you mean by and, 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 and we have, have been Bible? able... And we have been able to plausibly identify the star based on archaeology that has revealed to us what Babylonians believed. So when it says, so it doesn't say Jupiter. It does it say 30 degree rotation. It doesn't have to say any of that. <laughs> <laughs> this is where Jimmy is importing things into there. Now, here's another thing worth noting. Indeed, the text does not say Jupiter or any planet for that sake. Now, there's, I think, a little bit more where they talk also about where the word planet comes from, and it comes from the phrase uh, planetes ester. Uh, so wandering star ultimately is supposed to be meaning. So can the word star refer to a planet? Yes. But there's something most people do if you have a term that can be very generic and you want it to be about something specific, you use a word that specifies. If I say some guy came in, you can't say, um, oh, that was Jim from accounting. It's like, no, I just said some guy. How did you get something that specific? If Matthew mm -hmm. was trying to imply that it was a planet, he would have used the word for planet or the word for the name of that planet. That's how this normally works. After you've said, all right, the comet-like star came in and then the star did this, it's like, okay, once you have already established the kind of star that this is, and then you refer to it as star, all right, you've actually now specified it by having a generic term where aster can generally refer to basically any bright light in the sky, but then to say it's something specific based on no evidence from the Gospel of Matthew itself is importing what needs to be described. And as I noted before, it doesn't even just say a star. Jimmy was actually um, uh, misspeaking about there. It says his star, his star. the star of him, uh, to be hyper-literal in that translation, uh, which means this isn't just any normal store, uh, star in the sky, it is specific to an individual, and no one ever talked about Jupiter in that sort of way. I've read ancient horoscopes, I've read medieval horoscopes and things like that, and no one has ever referred to a star as an individual's star. In fact, uh, this is actually something part of my ongoing research, is the phrase his star actually is a bit interesting, because if I try to look for any examples of a star related as a, like with a personal identifier. I've only found two examples of that in like all of ancient literature. And it gives an interesting conclusion. One of them is related to the star of Julius Caesar, the one that was seen after his death. Mm -hmm. And also at the death of a um, young boy uh, by the name of Antinous, who was a lover of the emperor Hadrian. He ended up like dying in the Nile River. Um, Hadrian was completely distraught. And uh, people said, hey, look up in the sky. There's a new star there. That's um, Antonius' star, or Antonius' star. But in both of those cases, when you say his star or the star of that person, that was also identifying that person with the star. You're saying that isn't just the star representing Julius Caesar, that is the soul of Julius Caesar himself. That's not just a star representing Antonius, that is Antonius' soul up in heaven. So it's kind of interesting to see his star referring to Jesus' star and we like I mentioned before in the Revelation of Magi, Jesus literally is a star. And there's also that thing in Revelation and in first or in Second Peter, where Jesus refers to himself or is or Jesus is referred to as the morning star in that star mm -hmm. hymn from uh, Ignatius. It also seems to identify Jesus with the star. So I've been exploring the possibility: could there be even more mythology behind this already completely legendary star story? Yeah, that's so kind of interesting. Jimmy is looking it, for yeah. Yeah, no, Jimmy's looking for science behind it. I'm finding, I pull back the layers and it's like, hey, there's even more mythology down here. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, that kind of uh, makes me wonder if there's any kind of like connection in Jewish ideas like uh, prior to Christianity and even concurrent with C Christianity of like how these stars relate to like the the supposed um, beings like in the firmament and in the various <laughs> levels of heaven. Like I wonder how that kind of coincides with each other like what what did they think about these things and you oh, know yeah. just mm -hmm. uh, 
kind of rounding out here uh, with this uh, the Star of Bethlehem uh, discussion, uh, I find that that Jimmy was just woefully misinformed, um, you know, on a lot of the historical context that he's talking about, and it I don't I. I I I'm, like I, I, I feel like yeah, your assessment's correct in that Jimmy is getting this from somewhere else, even he's not telling us where, but who wherever yeah. he's getting this from, and, oh, it definitely he, seems definitely. more like Da Vinci Code level kind of shit rather than yeah. uh, uh, an actual like uh, a genuine reading of the text because like you did a genuine reading of the text right here on on this video and uh it seems like jimmy is uh departing from what the authors literally wrote so um yeah. you know and he's I, also departing from uh a millennium and a half of catholic and protestant uh, interpretation of this story and again it's like hey uh, literally i have um, St. Augustine on my side and how I'm interpreting this as a miraculous star. Uh, and I want to actually highlight this as well, because it talks about, well, the experts will understand this. Um, before St. Augustine, Augustine of Hippo became a Christian. He was in a different faith system. He was a Manichaean and the Manichaeans were big into astrology. So um, among the things that St. Augustine studied and knew a fair bit about was astronomy and astrology. When he then converted to Christianity, and then he's having these um, uh, dialogues with a, uh, another Manichaean by the name of Faustus, um, he basically points out, it's like, and don't you dare try calling this uh, star of Bethlehem as something astrological. This is clearly a star that breaks away from the normal nature of all stars, and you can see that based on the way it moves around and hovers around. So it's like someone who is um, pretty damn important to the Catholic tradition, among others, um, who was in the know about the nature of astronomy and astrology at the time because he literally studied it. And he is there straight up denying any truth to those claims, um, full stop. So, mm. again, I've got basically, I would say, the facts and the tradition on, on my side. And I would hope that Jimmy would be the uh, the better Catholic of the two of us and follow Catholic tradition and how to interpret this. <laughs> uh, I am curious that uh, just uh, we need to be wrapping up and everything. But uh, what was your interaction with Jimmy before when you confronted him about this uh, Bethlehem star thing? So um, I did a little bit of searching back because I had to remind myself um, uh, what any of that was. And so uh, apparently we had like some back and forth in the comment section on I forget which blogging site. And then he went and wrote another blog kind of trying to respond and trying to argue that um, I fundamentally didn't understand the Greek uh, that was uh, being used there. And so my interpretations were faulty and his were still possible, um, even though so many of the things were just not well defended or even said, well, in English, this is, you know, how we would mean things. And so um, I think this is how I can interpret this in Greek. It's just like very often not bring able and bringing able to uh, sorry, not able to bring any philological um, evidence to his side, and again ignoring the entirety of the interpretation history of this. Um, and when I say the entire interpretation history, before I wrote my book on the star of Bethlehem, I wrote an article on literally the entire history of the interpretation of the star from the second century to modern times. Mm -hmm. um, and so I basically have read every ancient and medieval commentary on this subject matter. And so when I say I did not find a single exception, everyone says this star is supernatural. Um, I can back that up. <laughs> and I got that published through a peer reviewed um, uh, 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 press uh, through the journal uh, Zygon Journal of Science and Religion. And yeah, so I've been at this for a while. I think I know my stuff. And unfortunately, Jimmy had to um, only run back to his own blog to say that um, he actually knew better. Yeah, it kind of sounds like he was making a possible, therefore probable type of argument. Um, it's it's very much along those sorts of lines. Um, he, he seems to be more definite about it than it's just me being merely possible. He's saying, no, we've actually been able to identify the Star of Bethlehem based mm -hmm. on this sort of stuff. But um, again, if you read for what the text actually says, no naturalistic explanation can fit it at all, with maybe the exception of UFOs, uh, an alien spacecraft could potentially do these sorts of motions, but even that is, you know, pushing uh, our scientific knowledge really to the edge, to put it mildly, um, and also all the other historical reasons that make the whole thing dubious. Um, so, yeah, there's a few, just a few problems. I mean, we've only been talking about these problems for, what, two hours? 
<laughs> yeah, there's and, a few yeah. problems with all of this stuff. Well, you, you know, uh, Doctor Adair, I really appreciate you coming on and 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 doing all this. I mean, that was a huge data dump for me because you know I could hit at the bullshittery that was that was happening with with Jimmy's uh, little. Uh, spiel there about you know the bethlehem star but i couldn't articulate it very well other than just to say it sounds like bullshit to me but i'm glad that you were able to put it in in its social uh socio-cultural aspect as well as the uh, the physics and and all that kind of stuff uh going on with the star so i i think that was a very a very valuable uh discussion uh to be had about the star as well as the virgin and birth well that we covered just hmm. prior to this. So uh, I really appreciate you, man. Uh, and uh, you want to tell everybody, remind everybody where they can find you, what you do, who you are and all that kind of good stuff. All right. Yeah. So like I say, uh, main website, you can find my stuff correlated together is Dr. Uh The books I have written um, best place to probably find them is um, Amazon, maybe the bottom of a trash bin, but Amazon is probably your best place to uh, find my work. Uh, when I say find my work, the ones that um, I have specifically written, if you want a volume like this one, again, like I say, the hardcover is the price of rent. Uh, I think, though, they did also put this out in paperback. So it is there might be a more affordable version of this out there. Uh, but of course, don't you dare don't don't you dare go to LibGen and try to find books like this and download them. Don't don't you. No, no, no. Don't you do that. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's a covering your ass, but <laughs> don't check this out at all. Not whatsoever. Wait. Covering my ass. I'm wearing like five diapers. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, again, uh, Dr. Adair, thank you so much. I will have a list down below of Dr. Adair's books if you want to go and get that to include uh, any other books uh, that would be helpful on this topic. So check that out down below. And uh, I guess I will talk to you heathens later. Don't forget to stand up. Ho, 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 your ass heathens. And I will see you heathens later. Hey, heathens, thank you for joining us today. What did you think about Jimmy Aiken's explanation for the Bethlehem star? Do you think that it actually matches with reality? Or do you think that he is really being anachronistic as well as misrepresenting what the text actually says? Let me know down below in the comments what you thought. And while you're down there, why don't you smash that like button and subscribe if you like this kind of content. Don't forget to stand up and use your voice. Bye, heathens.